Good afternoon and welcome to Coffee with Rich. My name is Rich Brown. I'm the co-host and co-founder of the American Warrior Society, America's leading self-defense website and self-defense podcast, The American Warrior Show. And today we have Ed Morales, who should need no introduction to our community, but I'll be reading Ed's bio briefly. This is Ed's second time on the show, and I'm honored to... uh, to uh, interview Ed today as my my good friend and business partner, Mike Seeklander, had the honors the first go around. As folks are waiting to jump on, I know this is an unusual time of day, but when you get an opportunity to talk to Ed Morales, you take that opportunity no matter what time it is. So let's go ahead and let's go ahead and thank our sponsors for the sponsors of the American Warrior Show. Sponsor, the, the number one sponsor is, of course, the American Warrior Society. we got everything for your self-defense needs. Check us out, AmericanWarriorSociety.com. We also have Century Martial Arts, makers of the Bob XL. Pick up your Bob XL today and take your striking to the next level. Want to work on your lapel chokes, a little ground and pound? Bob doesn't mind at all. Need to take Bob to the range and shoot him because you get that three-dimensional targeting. That's good for Bob. APP Hemp Maker, the finest CBD products money can buy. The Cool Fire Trainer, guys, everybody is having a hard time getting ammunition today. Take that Cool Fire and use it to take your dry fire to the next level. We also have Mountain Man Medical. I tell you what, guys, today you're more likely to use that trauma kit to save years or loved one's life than you are that firearm. So check out Mountain Man Medical for makers of some of the finest and affordable trauma kits money can buy. And last but not least, Precision Holsters, maker of the holster that I'm actually wearing right now, the Ultra Appendix Holster and quality tactical belts. You can find links to all of our sponsors and get amazing discounts for watching today's show just by clicking the link below. Also, Ed's book, if you want to pick up Ed's book that details his not only his career, but the horrible events of April 11th, 1986, you can do that in the links below. We have several people jumping on, but before I welcome them onto the show, I want to read Ed's uh, bio, if I could. Uh, Edmundo Morales Jr. is a retired FBI agent with 25 years of service. He served in Washington, D.C., three tours in Miami, Omaha, Tucson, and two tours at the FBI Academy in Quantico. Ed worked in a variety of areas, including program management, as a supervisor, classified government programs manager, general and violent crimes investigations, organized crime investigations, narcotics investigations, undercover operations, Southwest Border Initiative, crime scene investigations, interviewing and interrogations, counterterrorism, threat assessment, data collection, reporting of criminal and security incidents, firearms training, and street survival training. Ed has over 15 years of undercover work experience and high crime undercover cases. Ed has been involved in two deadly force confrontations and has been wounded twice. One of those encounters was the infamous April 1986 FBI gunfight in Miami. Ed was selected as the 1986 National Police Officer of the Year, the recipient of the U.S. Attorney General's Award for Exceptional Heroism, and the FBI Medal of Valor. In addition to all those accolades, Ed served his country for four years in the United States Marines from 1971 to 1975. Ed's book, FBI Miami Firefight, Five Minutes That Changed the Bureau, can be bought at www.edmorales.com. Once again, links in today's show notes. Good afternoon, Ed, and welcome to the show, sir. Well, thanks, Rich. I really appreciate being back. And uh, I, I also want to thank your sponsors. Uh, that's a, quite a list of sponsors you have there. It, you know, it, uh, it's well, well, well worth the, uh, the effort. Yeah, there, there's some amazing sponsors, you know. And Mike and I, before we will take on any sponsor, the company's got to send us the gear. We've got to use it. We've got to abuse it. And if we like it and we decide this a company we want to do business with, then we do. And I think that's important for our viewers to know that. Absolutely. Absolutely. Let's see who we got on the show today, uh, Ed, before we get started. Will is on, says, hello, Rich and Ed. Bruce is on. Guile from the Philippines says, I'm surprised that you came on. I bet you are, Guile. This isn't our normal time. Uh, Wade is on. TC says, good to see you upright and taking nourishment, Ed. <laughs> and uh, TC, does Ed owe you money? We need to find that out. <laughs> <laughs> if I do, that interest is going to be astronomical. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Walt says, Rich and Ed, he, uh, Walt is coin number 138. Uh, thank you, sir. Okay. Let's, I, 
Ed, I'm just so excited to actually get to talk to you. I don't think I told you this when we were speaking before, but when I was uh, 16, my grandparents came back from Miami. Uh, they were they were produce buyers and sellers, so they would drive from East Tennessee, buy produce in Miami, and sell it up in Georgia and Tennessee. And they said we were at this gas station, and this all we heard was loud gunfire. And we found out later it was the FBI. So it's funny that my grandparents were like four blocks away on that terrible day in April 1986, which is crazy ironic. That is, that is, that is that's unbelievable. I mean, the, the link there is just uh, astronomical, you know? So. It's, it's such a small, weird world yeah. that we live in. Uh, Ed, so I just read your bio, sir. Um, is there anything that we didn't uncover in that bio? No, I, I think that pretty much covers it. I mean, the rest of it, you know, it's pretty much mundane, you know. Uh, you know, it's not like the movies, you know, you don't, you're, you're not always running and gunning, you know, 90% of the time, you know, it, it's the opposite. 90% of the time, you're just kind of, you know, doing paperwork, you know, doing mundane things, you know, it's that 10% of the time that scares the crap out of you, you know, so, <laughs> you know, yeah. I mean, but I mean, it's good. Sometimes it's good, you know, stuff, but other times it could be quite frightening, you know, so. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yeah. So um, did you join the, we're going to go all the way back then, if that's okay with you. Tell me about, so did you get out of high school and then join the Marine Corps? What led you into that? Well, you know, uh, what? That's, a, that's an interesting way of putting it. You know, what led me there was Uncle Sam. Uh, when I was 18, uh, Vietnam was going hot and heavy. Um, and I got an invitation from uh, our uncle. You know, he wanted me to come down and uh, <laughs> and join his armed forces. You know, so I said, "Well, not much I can do about that." You know, I mean, I, I could go to Mexico or Canada. You know, and uh, I don't know which one I would have chosen. You know, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> instead, I just uh, I decided, well, I'm going to show my uncle. You know, I'm I'm not going to get drafted. You know, I'm I'm going to join the Marine Corps. So uh, there was kind of a tradition in my family. I had a, an uncle and a couple of cousins. And, you know, and, and the family that had uh, served in, in the Marine Corps. And, and the, you know, I always saw them, you know, as, as I looked up to, to them, I, I should say, uh, you know, the dress blues, you know, and, and they, all, all three of them had served in Vietnam, you know, and, and they had different stories. You know, most of the times they didn't say anything. You know, they were very quiet about what they did in Vietnam, you know, but, uh, you know, I, I was proud of them, you know, and, and I said, well, what the heck, you know, if it's good enough for them, it's good enough for me. So I, I enlisted and, um, Enlisted in September 1979. And what did you I'm do? Sorry, in <laughs> September 1971. <laughs> I sort of say it's your bio. So, what did you do during your four years? Actually, uh, I went through my first six months was uh, basic training. Uh, went through boot camp, then w went to advanced infantry training, and then I went to my MOS school, which was uh, I thought it was absolutely fantastic. I was. Uh, for some reason, I don't know why, I was I was selected to be a forward observer for naval gunfire. Um, you know, kind of like the you know, as you see, you know, videotape of uh, Marines landing on Iwo Jima or Okinawa, and you've got guys on the radio. Th those are the guys calling in uh, in naval gunfire. You know, to to take out uh, problem spots. You know, and stuff. And that's what that's what I was trained as. You know, and it was absolutely fascinating i mean i was an 18 year old kid from from a little you know rink dink bum town in texas you know the the biggest thing i saw was a tractor or, or a semi-tractor trailer you know so uh you know here i am you know on, on huge ships you know firing huge cannons you know <laughs> at um, we had a practice island in uh, san clemente uh, off of off the california for, coast and um it was just absolutely great. But there was one side of it that absolutely terrified me to death. Uh, we had to uh, we had to practice going out on, on rafts, you know, from the ship. Because, you know, we would be uh, like, you know, in the first wave, you know. So um, we, we would practice, you know, on, on, you know, just, you know, like for the future, practice on rafts and stuff it, with our gear and stuff like that, you know. And you know what? I'm a non-swimmer. I don't swim at all. I mean, I, I, I swim like a rock, you know, so I was terrified of falling over overboard, you know, on, on one of these small craft that we had, you know, it's like, oh, my God, you know, so luckily that never happened. So I'm, I'm still around to, to, to talk about it. But th that was my um, that was my first six months. And we were actually on uh, on tab. Uh, we were going to be deployed uh, uh, to, to Vietnam. Uh, the unit was, 
And we were actually in, in the process of loading up, you know, all the gear and stuff, you know, to, to be transported on ships and stuff to uh, to the Southeast Asia. And uh, one one night, you know, I, I mean, we're sleeping in our in our vehicles, you know, because we, we had to wait our turn to load them up and stuff. So um, we get a call or, or notif notified by one of the sergeants saying, hey, you know, pack up your gear. We're going back to the base, back to Camp Pendleton. And, and everybody's going, what the heck's going on? You know, it's just, I don't know, you know, don't ask me. I'm just following orders, you know. So found out the next day that uh, the Honorable Mr. Nixon, President of the United States, um, he, he has a bad rap, but uh, he, I, I will always admire him, you know, because he canceled the war. You know, uh, I, unbeknownst to me, you know, I mean, again, I, but by that time, I'm probably 19 years old, you know, uh, just had a birthday. And, uh, I, I didn't know that the peace talks were ongoing, you know, uh, Secretary of State Kissinger and, 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 and uh, President Nixon, you know, they, they, they were going back and forth, you know, at the peace talks and stuff. And uh, they they came to some some form of peace and they stopped sending troops overseas, you know. So that oh. uh, that was my that's that's how close I got to Vietnam, you know. So um, so then, you know, we're in a quote unquote peacetime Marine Corps, you know, so, um, you know. What do you do? Train, 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 you know. And then one day I, uh, I was in formation and uh, the CEO comes out, <clears throat> excuse me, CEO comes out, you know, he he, get, he uh, has his usual morning, uh, you know, conversation with, with the platoons. And um, towards the end, he said, hey, listen, um, I need to see uh, Corporal Jones and, and PFC Morellis at, at the formation, you know, and, and so, uh oh, what the heck did I do now, you know? So, so uh, as it turned out, he said uh, that uh, we we were the only two Marines in the the unit that qualified for a potential job, uh, a, a Marine Corps position. With, I, I knew nothing about it. it. Was called Marine Security Guard Battalion, and uh, those are the uh, the. Uh, the Marines that, that are stationed overseas, uh, guarding our embassies, our, our U.S. embassies. So uh, he uh, said, "Hey, <laughs> there's only two people in the platoon that qualify, you know, because you have to have no arrest record and you have to have three years of service left on your tour." So, of course, that had that brought a bunch of snickers from the whole unit. You know, it's like no arrest record. It's like. <laughs> I guess that disqualified like you know two hundred men. Yeah, <laughs> you know, yeah. So you know. So anyway, I, I went to the CEO's office and I asked him. You know, uh, Corporal Jones went in before me. You know, he he went in two ten seconds later. He stepped out. You know, I said okay. So I went in uh, next. You know, and I said, sir. You know, he said uh, you qualify for the you know Marine Security Guard Battalion. You know, blah blah blah. I said, well, first of all, sir, what is it? And he explained it to me, and I said, "Well, well, sir, what do you think? I mean, is it is it a good is it a good unit? I mean, is it, is it a good thing that uh, volunteer for?" He said, "Yeah, I think so." So, based on his recommendation, I said, "Okay, sir, count me in." And uh, within a couple of weeks, two weeks later, um, I get orders, and and I, I turned in all my combat gear and packed my my trash. You know, as I say, <laughs> I had one sea bag um, full of belongings, and uh, I was transferred to Washington D.C. Um, assigned to a, a tiny little base. Uh, you probably can't even find it on the map now. It, it was next to the Pentagon, uh, next to um, Arlington National Cemetery called um, uh, Henderson Hall. Uh, it's just a tiny, it's like four city blocks. And uh, I, you know, you'd you know, you never never know it was a base there, you know. So uh, I spent uh, about two or three months there uh, training, you know, and all the various things, you know, protocol, you know, Department of State, uh, rules and regulations, procedures, you know, everything else, you know, that, that goes along with it, obviously security and uh, firearms training. You know, so that was my first uh, uh, trip to Quantico, Virginia. In uh, 1972, I, uh, they put us on a bus and we went down to Quantico. I thought I was going into West Virginia. I mean, that was that's how rural, you know, Washington, D.C. was back then. I, I truly thought I, we, we were driving to West Virginia. There was nothing there, just trees and more trees. You know, so um, it was a great experience for me. I um, it was probably one of the best things that ever happened. Uh, my first office of assignment, or my first embassy, was uh, Sofia, Bulgaria, and um, talk about an experience. You know, that was at the peak. Uh, well, maybe not the peak, the high, the 
backside of a peak of the Cold War. And uh, I got to see it firsthand, you know, but that, like I said, by that time I was 19 oh. years old, you know, and I had had all the briefings and, you know, all the do's and don'ts and, you know, all the, the threats and, you know, games that the, the communist bloc played with, with the, uh, you know, Western diplomats and so on. So uh, it was an eye opening experience going to Sofia, Bulgaria. I mean, it was like, what in the world? I, I mean, I thought South Texas was poor. You know, back in the seventies, but I got to uh, supposedly this this capital in Europe, and I thought I was like in a in a big uh, hometown. You know, it, it was like th there were no lights. There were no there was no there were no street lights. I mean, there were street lights, but I mean, every three or four or five blocks there was a street light. There were no advertising signs. There was no color. Uh, everything was drab, you know, everything was brown or gray, and the people looked like they they were carrying the weight of the world on their shoulders. They were, you know, always hunched over looking down, and the, the word that comes to, to my, my brain right away, the one word to describe it was depressing. Mm -hmm. It was absolutely depressing to see. Uh, the people and the, and the city, and uh, they used coal to heat their uh, heat their homes. You know, so everything was covered in you know, like probably like probably like a Pennsylvania coal town. You know, everything was covered in black suit and stuff. And um, the the people wore, you know, they had no concept of what cotton was. I don't think you know. I mean, it, there was nothing like a t shirt or, or anything like that that people would wear. They they all wore wool. You know, in the summer, and I'm thinking, oh my lord, that's got to be terribly hot. You know, so, but uh, that was, I mean, it really was eye opening. I mean, I I really got to see what the utopian uh, dream of that communist ha communism has to offer, and I'm thinking, oh my god, if this is if this is a paradise, my god, I'd hate to see hell. You know, <laughs> and then after that, you know, I did a year there, and then I was transferred to, um, you know, and I told them not to. I begged them not to to transfer me to Madrid, Spain. But they they did it anyway. They sent me to Madrid, Spain, you know. So I ended up spending uh, between my military duty and then uh, I, I stayed I uh, stayed overseas. I ended up living in, in Madrid for five years. After that, it was fantastic, fantastic city, fantastic country, you know. So you know, real lucky, you know, uh, little uh, little country boy from South Texas, you know, in Madrid, Spain. It's like holy moly, man! I I just in expanded my horizons you know it opened my eyes to what the rest of the world was like yeah it's a beautiful uh, uh, spain is a beautiful place been yeah. there a couple of times i love it yeah. i'm surprised you even came back <laughs> well you know back then you know uh, it's funny you know you hear so much about immigration today you know the borders and this and that you know uh americans I think they have a misconception of what the rest of the world is like. <clears throat> Excuse me. The rest of the world is very strict on their visas. Yes. You know, uh, they're very strict on immigration, you know, and, and the, the, the only reason I had an exemption was because I was assigned to the embassy. And um, uh, Spain, France, uh, I think at the time, a lot, of, a lot of the other European countries, if you were there as a visitor, an expat, you know, working for a company or just living there, you have to leave. And even today in Mexico, uh, if if you're a foreigner living living in, in in Mexico, and back at the time, in the, back in the seventies, if you were a, a foreigner living living in those countries, you had to leave the country every six months. They gave you a visa, you know, either a, a document or it was stamped in your passport, and you were told you have six months. You know, visit. Okay, if you violate this rule, you will be arrested. I'm thinking, oh, okay, well, no, no one wants to be arrested, you know. So uh, everybody complied. You know, it, you had to drive to the border either at the airport or a physical border between France and you know Spain and France or Spain and Portugal, and you had to leave the country for 24 hours, and then you had to come if you wanted to. You you came back 24 hours later, and then they would stamp your passport again with a new six month visa. Okay, so that you know, the, uh, you know, this conception, this misconception that uh, oh yeah, Europeans are you know open and this and that about visas. No, absolutely not. Uh, 
you know, and uh, if you violate your visa, you, you know, you were, you were arrested on the spot. None of this, hey, listen, I forgot, I'm a day late, or, you know, I'm a student, or I was sick. Okay, you were sick, fine, you know, you're going to jail, and you're going for a judge, you know. So, um, you know, but I was lucky, and I, I managed to stay there five years because I was uh, affiliated with the embassy. So after your Marine Corps career, how did you how did you transition to the FBI? What was that like? Well, part you know my my last uh, three years in Spain, I was going to the University of Maryland. Uh, I don't know if you've heard the commercials on TV. I had no idea the University of Maryland was was had what they call the the world campus or you know international campus program or something like that. But uh, anywhere there was a uh, military base, U.S. military base, they had uh, university. Uh, extensions, uh, you know, schools, uh, NYU, well, not NYU, there was University of Maryland, and there was two or three other universities that offered programs, you know, overseas. So um, when I got out, I, I started going to, to, to school, college full time, you know, on the GI Bill. So um, I was going to school, and I had like, kind of like a general vision, you know, of, of what I wanted to do with my life, you know, being with the, having seen what the State Department did, I saw that, um, there were uh, there was uh, the State Department has had a, had a unit uh, called the security office, the regional security officers, you know, the, the, the guys in charge of security for the embassy. And there were other programs, you know, uh, that I got to see. I, I, I met some the first time I met DEA agents, you know, was at the embassy. And the first time I ever met an FBI agent was at the U.S. Embassy in Madrid, you know, and uh, I got to um, I got to be a real good. He got to be we got to be good friends. And. Uh, he was a real nice gentleman, uh, gentleman, gentleman by the name of Jerry Grimaldi, and uh, he was straight out of Washington. And he, I, I met him for three years. He was he was assigned for three years at the embassy, and it's an interesting thing. The way thing the thing the way it happened. I mean, it's just like you know, time and chance, luck. Um, he was a good friend. I admired him. Everybody looked up to him, you know. And uh, he, he was, you know, the old the old. Uh, you know, movie uh, stereotype. He was the G-man in, in, in the building. You know, so uh, so uh, one day we were at a at a gathering, and I, I was in my junior year, and uh, he pulled me aside. He said, "Hey, Ed, you know, how's how's your how 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 are you doing in your studies?" I said, "I'm I'm I'm doing pretty good, Jerry." You know, he said, oh, "How how much longer before you graduate?" I said, "Well, I just finished my junior year, and I'm I'm you know because I was there on an accelerated pace. You know, I I, I got my I got a four year degree in three years because I went full time summer. I took summer summer classes, the whole the whole thing, because I wanted to get wanted to get my degree as soon as possible and get to work as soon as possible. So, I tell him I should graduate in about eight or nine months. You know, by he says, good good. He said, I, I've been watching you." He said, and and I think you're a good guy. I think you know you're a, you know you're a good person. And I was wondering, have you ever considered applying to the FBI? <laughs> I mean, you. I wish I could have seen the look on my face because I mean, my mouth must have probably just fell. You know, hit my jaw, bounced off the floor, and then back up. You know, it's like, what? I said, are you serious? He said, yeah. He said, I, I, like I said, I've been watching you. You're a good man. You're a good, you're a good person. You're, you know, you're courteous and so on and so forth. And uh, with your, when you get complete your four year degree, he said, you'll be eligible. He said, um, the, uh, and then I asked him the, the, the typical question, you know, uh, I, I said, I thought FBI just had to be attorneys or accountants. He said, well, you know, that, that is, the, those are two of the big programs that the Bureau hires, you know, from. But we also hire uh, engineers and uh, linguists and all different kinds of people, you know, uh, you know, different backgrounds and stuff, you know. And uh, he said there's also a, a category called diversified. He said we hire um, people that don't fit into into the other categories. Like if you're not an engineer or an attorney or, or a, a, an accountant or a linguist, uh, he said um, they they hire what's called diversified, and and that's what we, where uh, this is him talking. He said that's where we pick up our military guys and our former cops and stuff like that. So uh, they have to have a four year degree, a minimum, and they have to have uh, three years of experience. But you know we, we we pick up a variety of people in that category. So he said you qualify under that program. He said how's your Spanish? And I said that's pretty good. I mean. I'm, I was I grew up speaking Spanish, and I was living in Spain where you had to speak Spanish. So my I, back then, my Spanish was 
really good. Now I know it's kind of deteriorating, you know, so. But I said, yeah, I, you know, my Spanish is pretty good on a scale of one to five. It's probably a four. It goes good. So you, you fit two categories. You, you fit the, the linguist, the language program and the diversified program. So he said, this is what I want to do. I'm going to I'm going to write headquarters and get an application. When they send it to me, I'll, I'll look you up and, and, and I'll give it to you. And I would recommend that when you get it, make make several copies and start rough drafting the uh, the answers. You know, in other words, don't don't burn up the original because you're only going to get one, you know. So so he said, rough draft your, your answers, you know, and work it out, you know, until you, you refine your answers, you know, to a short, concise information, you know. And then uh, when you're ready, you know, prepare the original. And he said, by the way, use me as a reference. You know, I, I, I want you to use me as a reference because, you know, I, I want people to know, you know, what I think of you and so on. I said, well, gee, Jerry, thanks, thanks a lot. I really appreciate that. So uh, that, that's, the way it, that's the way it progressed. I mean, he basically recruited me. And uh, from, the time that, from the time that conversation happened until I was accepted into the FBI, it was 18 months because I, I obviously I had to finish my, my uh, college degree. And um, when I got to, uh, when, I, when I returned back to the U.S. in uh, January of 1979, I called FBI headquarters and I asked them, I said, hey, listen, I, I'm an applicant. Uh, I sent my application in, you know, and they said, well, you know, give us your name and date of birth and so on and so forth. So I gave it to them and they called me back and said, sir, we don't have any copy of your application. We don't know where it went, you know, so. Ugh. I said, well, that's not good. You know? <laughs> so I said, hey, I have a copy of the original. Uh, will that will that suffice? And, and they said, yeah, it will. But uh, they, they said, don't send it to FBI headquarters. What where, do, where are you living? You need to send it to the field office in your area. And I was living in Falls Church, Virginia at the time. So um, they said, well, the closest office is Alexandria. So I sent it to Alexandria with a cover letter and you know, about, I don't know, four or six weeks later, I get a call from some lady, you know, she said, hey, this is, you know, so-and-so, uh, I'm, I'm with the applicant unit at the Alexandria field office, you know, we've got your application, we'd like to, you know, uh, schedule you for a, an entrance exam. I said, okay, super, you know, so I was working part-time because I, I, had, I had only been back about six weeks, you know, so, um, they, they scheduled it, and I went through the process. They scheduled an entrance exam. I passed, and then they, um, they just went on from there, step after step after step, you know, and uh, um, took the psychological testing and, and then the uh, uh, language testing and uh, just progressed from there. And from the time I returned to the U.S. until I was uh, uh, selected to be an FBI uh, candidate, I was, it was nine months, nine months, so, you know, Pretty fast, I guess, you know. So then I went to the uh, FBI Academy September 1979, you know, and I managed to squeak through, you know, uh, by by the skin of my teeth, you know. <laughs> yeah, I, uh, Dr. T. C. Fuller, of course, he's a retired FBI agent. He says uh, they don't talk to you unless you're really, really ridiculously good looking. Of course, uh, I don't know how Dr. Fuller got in the uh, FBI, the NFS. Well, you know what though. It's good looking. There, there are so few of us left. You know? <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I hear you, sir. So, so you go to the FBI Academy, you squeak through, and uh, tell us about what your career was like leading up to that April morning in 1986. Well, you know, I, I've talked it over with with uh, my friends, you know, and it's difficult to explain. You know, it's kind of like. Uh, you go through all this training, you know, you, you, you go, you pass everything and, and, and then you're put in a position where, you know, from one day to the next, you're, you're officially a, a federal agent. You know, you're an FBI agent with the powers of arrest and, you know, you're carrying a firearm, you know, you the power to investigate the uh, federal cases and so on and so forth. But I'll tell you what though, I mean, you're really like, what the heck? You know? I mean, you're, you're driving around thinking, man, you know, it, you 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 don't know you don't know what your limits are you know you don't know what what truly I mean I didn't you know again you know I, I mean my experience was in in uh, in Texas in the Marine Corps in Spain and then at the academy I mean don't get me wrong the academy taught me a, a great deal but you know I didn't have uh, the the uh, advantage of having been a former law enforcement officer 
And, uh, you know, I didn't have any OJT until I got to, to, to my first field office. I was assigned to the Washington field office. Good old Buzzards Point, you know, and it's called Buzzards Point for a reason, you know. So, <laughs> so but um, once I got to the field office, you know, they they, uh, they 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 assign you to a senior agent, and you basically are his tag along. You tag along with a senior agent, you know. He'll uh, he'll show you things and tell you how you know how how procedures work and so on and so forth. You know, simple stuff. You know, like. Um, how, how do you check out a car? How do you, you know, how, how do you get use of a, of a government car to go cover your leads? You know, that type of stuff. And, and uh, you're signing, signing, signing in in the morning, you know. Back then we, we did it with, uh, you had to physically sign in, you know, with a signature. I don't know what it's, I don't know what they do now, but um, you had uh, a, a physical sign in a sheet and then you had your, uh, what they call a time card. It was a, a, a three by five card and you filled it out okay every time you le you left the office you had to fill it out saying okay um depart office at 0830 in route to uh state department or in route to uh, riggs bank you know on on 13th street you know that type of stuff you know and uh when you got back you had to take the you know you had to take the card out you know from your sec it was left with the secretary you had to take the card out you know and then you you put down your return time and then the rest of the time you know you you had to basically account for your time it's like a like a log it's a daily log you know that you had to keep you know you show up at, to work at seven what did you do okay seven you show up then at 8 30 you left and you came back at 2 30 what did you do between 2 30 and 5 2 30 and 5 30 you know that type of stuff so it was like a daily log and uh uh, that's called, that was called a three card, you know, so uh, again, I don't know what the FBI does now, you know, but back then that was a way of accounting for your, your time. You know, they, they actually said, okay, you worked uh, six hours on this category of crime and you worked four hours on administrative issues, you know, so, uh, you know, it was just a, a, basically a timekeeping tool, you know, so, but at the same time though, uh, this is the era before cell phones. Okay, this was the era before pagers. Yeah. Okay, so uh, you know they had to have a way to find you. Okay, uh, in case you, something happened to you or you you didn't return. Okay, I mean I mean don't get me wrong, you had radios, in, you had police radios, I mean FBI radios in your car, but they could only reach you if you're in the car. You know, if you stop and you you go, you go into the Riggs Bank, um, and you know how, how do they get a hold of you? Okay, if something happens, you know, so that was the rule back then. You had to be in communication every two hours on duty. You know, you had to some you had to report somehow. You know, either with a phone call or you or the radio. Hey, listen, this is um, agent so and so. Uh, I'm back. You know, on duty ten seven ten eight. You know, uh, so it was just a way of like locate. It's a locator card basically, and, you know, because again, you know, nowadays, Hey, you know, where's, where's Ed? Hey, call him on the cell phone, but boom, you know, now back then it's like, Hey, if somebody needed you or, or if uh, you had a family emergency or something, you were all dependent on the radio. That's it. And if, if you were out of the car, you weren't, you weren't next to the radio, you know, so, you know, it, interesting things. But anyway, I digress, you know, they, 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 uh, they taught you stuff like that. admin stuff, you know, it's like, Hey, this is the way the way you do certain things. You know, this is the um, you know uh, the bank robbery. I was assigned to a bank robbery squad. I was introduced to the robbery unit at Metro PD, um, Washington Metro. Um, good guys, you know, real good guys. You know, now those guys are a different breed. I mean, because they're all locals. They're all from, generally speaking, they're all from the local Washington D.C. area. You know, so you know they were all typical old detectives. You know, it's like you know salt of the earth. You know, grumpy cigars smoking spitting on the sidewalk type of guys, you know, so, and I say guys, because, uh, you know, at, at the time I didn't see any, any women, uh, on the, on the, uh, robbery unit, the FBI was starting to hire more and more women back in the, in, in the seventies or late, late seventies, you know, and now I know, I mean, at, at least, you know, uh, got 25, 30, 35% of the, uh, employees or female agents, you know, so, uh, I mean, it's just commonplace now, but back then uh, a female agent was pretty rare. I mean, it was like maybe 
in a, in a, the, the Washington the Washington field office had 400 agents back in, in 1980, and I think maybe maybe there were 20 female agents at the time, you know. Oh. But I was told that 20 is, is was about 15 more than they had before, you know. So, you know, times times change. You know, we uh, the FBI was jumping into the 20th century with both feet, you know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So um, you end up in Miami, um, and you're on. Are you on a bank robbery squad in 1986 in Miami, Ed? Yes, sir. Uh, well, you know, when I, when I was at WFO, I was on a bank robbery squad, and then uh, what happened? Um, it, it, you know, God, I saw it coming back to me. It's like ancient history. There was a, a bulletin that came around. They were looking for a, an undercover agent, uh, to uh, Hispanic, Spanish speaker to uh, work on a, on a sensitive operation, uh, foreign counterintelligence in uh, the South. So uh, I volunteered for that. And I really can't say anything more than that. You know, I volunteered for, for that. And I worked on that case for 18 months. Uh, so I was away from the from Washington for 18 months uh, between 1982 to 83. And when I came, I came back to, to Washington in '83, and I was uh, reassigned to a terrorism squad uh, after the bank robbery squad. So uh, we, I was, uh, I was working on a terrorism squad way, way back when uh, terrorism was like the bastard child of, of uh, investigations. And I say bastard child because terrorism, by its nature, is a criminal act. I mean, you know, you you blow up a building, you blow up a car, you shoot somebody, you kidnap somebody. That's that's a crime, okay. But international terrorism also has uh, elements of counterintelligence, okay. So the FBI had had two two major programs: the criminal side, and then you had the intelligence side. And the intelligence side had certain rules and regulations governing classified material. And on the criminal side, you just, you know, it was basically open, open information. Okay. I mean, everything we did on the criminal side would end up in court. Okay. So, I mean, it, you know, it wasn't that, I mean, it was sensitive. It was law enforcement sensitive, but it wasn't quote unquote classified. So um, at the time, you know, nobody really knew what, what, what was our, was our squad counterintelligence or criminal, you know, so. <laughs> You know, it was kind of, like I said, we, we weren't, uh, a, you know, a duck. We weren't, uh, you know, nobody really knew where to put us, you know. So so uh, I remember, and I, I, it's funny, though, because I remember one time, uh, there were a few months there when we were designated uh, a C squad, C for criminal. We were C6. And then a few months later, we were designated CI12. Okay, so counterintelligence. So, so it's like, I mean, even even the FBI, you know, couldn't, you know, it's like, where, where do we fit this, you know? And it wasn't until much later, you know, a few years later that, you know, the, the violation of terrorism became its own unit, you know, became its own element. You know, it's like, okay, you had the criminal squads, you had the, the counterintelligence squads, and now you have terrorism squads, okay, they, they, they where they can marry counterintelligence information with criminal acts okay so i mean it, it it takes some finesse because you know you cannot you cannot divulge uh classified information even if it's you know involving a, a terrorist act you know so and boy did we learn that during 9 11 man holy cow you know we i i saw stuff you know that we were so backlogged uh, during 9 11 that I was sent TDY from Quantico to FBI headquarters, and I, I, we were going through uh, information that was coming in, and I saw, I saw some stuff. It's like holy Jesus, you know? How the hell? How the hell am I supposed to get this information to a squad in San San uh, in St. Louis? Okay, you know when it's coming from like Jesus himself, you know? It's like get get this information from jesus and send it to a a, a criminal squad in, in st louis it's like how do i bridge that gap yeah. you know, because i mean it, it, it's you know it, it still happens even today i mean during 9 11 it happened you know so we were we were there you know trying to finesse these these cases you know trying to trying to take information that's coming from on high 
and get it down into the lowest weeds of, of a criminal squad in, in, in some field office in, across the U.S., you know. And, you know, that, that um, I, I, I'm digressing here, but that's why th that description that I just told you is why the FBI gets a bad rap. OK, you know, you get these these uh, coppers, you know, these local guys saying hey, the FBI never tells us anything. You know, the, you know, they're all then, you know, they never share information, you know, and we they want everything from us, but they never share. Well, you know what? There's a lot of instances where you, we've got information that's coming from, you know, God only knows where that it is either classified or, or it's like like it's coming from a, an informant. That's one person next to the kingpin, you know, so it's very difficult to share that type of information because that information is singular in nature. There's only two people. You got the bad guy and the informant, you know, and, and if somebody rats, <laughs> the, the kingpin is going to know it wasn't me. You know? So, you know, but but uh, that drove the point home, you know, 9-11 uh, is like, you know, it, the, the local cops think, hey, you know, the FBI is, you know, they're, they're a bunch of uh, knuckleheads, you know, they don't share information. And I'll tell you what, there's a reason for that because a lot of that information that I saw was so sensitive. I mean, I'm talking about super duper. It's, it's kind of like uh, rush hour, uh, super duper GS 14 sensitive classified. You know, <laughs> yeah. well, yeah. this was this was man. So anyway, I'm sorry, I digress. But anyway, I, I came back from uh, from the undercover operation, and then I, I was eventually transferred to Miami, Florida, in 1985, and then I got assigned to. A, to the bank robber squad. I had married a, a young lady um, by the name of Elizabeth Olton, uh, and she was in Miami. That's why I got transferred to Miami. You know, to, you know, I mean, I'm in DC and she's in in Miami. That doesn't make for a, a productive marriage, you know. So, <laughs> you know, one of us had to move, you know. And believe me, I loved going to Miami as opposed to her coming to Washington, you know. So, and that's how I ended up on the bank robber squad. And man, you know, changing cities. I mean. It, if anybody's ever been to Miami and Washington, D.C., you know, it's like it's like night and day. You got a bunch of stuffy shirt, you know, three piece suit guys in D.C. And you've got a bunch of, you know, Guayavera, Guayavera wearing, you know, guys with khaki pants in, in Florida, you know, open but button, you know, button down shirts open, you know, a little a little flashy gold, a little of this. And I tell you what, the, the, the spice down there, you know, both. Uh, Food wise and people wise, it's just unbelievable, you know. So I had a great time down there, but um, the the bank robbery squad was just like it was fantastic. I mean, I truly, I told Liz and I've told my friends, I said I loved going to work. I loved going to work. You know, it was just. I mean, I, I would get up in the morning and I would think to myself, they pay me to do this. I mean, they're paying me to do this. You know, this is so great. You know. And uh, can I curse on your on your program? Is it absolutely. Bad? I'll just say this one time, okay? I would love nothing better than to fuck up some criminal's life, okay? I mean, it was that beautiful, that that fantastic. I would get up in the morning and I'm thinking, okay, whose life am I gonna screw up today? <laughs> you know, so, you know, love I mean, I, I wasn't, I mean, we weren't, we weren't picking on, on citizens, you know, we were picking on, on the scumbags, the criminals, you know, the, the murderers, the drug dealers, you know, the, 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 all the scum of the earth, you know, and I loved nothing better than to ruin their day, you know, and send them to jail for as long as I could. I mean, it was a great, great time, super time. So when you got there in 1985, Ed, had uh, Platt and Maddox already started robbing banks and armored cars at that point? No, 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 no. Uh, I got there in April of 85, and they didn't start until August of 85. Okay, so somewhere in that time frame, uh, and we've done a, a pretty extensive check on their on their history. Uh Platt was living in Miami, Maddox was living in Ohio, and sometime during that time frame in that year, uh, Maddox moved to Miami to, to be with his friend uh, Platt, and uh, they did start try to they, they tried to start a legitimate business. They started a, a lawn service, and I believe the lawn service was called Yankee Clipper. Uh, the, the the Yankee Clipper Lawn Service, you know, and I think they did try to go straight, but 
you know, I mean, that's that's a tough business, man. I mean, there must be like, I don't know, 5,000 lawn services in Miami. And, and you need them because, I mean, <laughs> plants grow 24-7, you know, in, in Florida. Up here in, in the north, you know, plants grow dormant. You know, but down there, man, they get all that sunshine, man. They're just like growing. You, you got to cut your grass almost every week, you know, for, you know, 365 days a year, you know. So, but uh, they weren't very successful. Let me ask and, you this, Ed. I, some of the things that I've read, it it would appear as if they murdered each other's wives. Have you, has the Bureau looked into that at all? Oh, yeah. The, 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 the Bureau looked into that way back when, you know. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, especially... Uh, Maddox's wife uh, in, in Ohio, um, she was, I mean, brutally murdered. I mean, she, it wasn't, you know, it was a, a brutal crime. It was, uh, she was cut, she was stabbed and, and with a knife, a large knife, that, that's, all, that's all they knew. And she had her throat cut. Okay, so it, it was a violent, very personal act, you know. And uh, unfortunately, uh, one of her coworkers, walked in uh on on the event and the co-worker ended up dying too you know so there were two people killed at, at the at, at her work and uh, nobody saw anything okay i mean that again this is this is 85 there were no cameras you know were, were i mean banks had cameras you know but in the old days banks banks had like these three second ca you know cameras that would every three seconds they would take a picture Okay, it wasn't continuous, you know, real running and running and running, you know, so, but um, no, nobody saw anything. And, and the thing is, you know, it was always suspected that Platt had gone to Ohio to kill Maddox's wife. Okay, now Platt's wife ends up dying in 85 also in, in December. Uh, now, she allegedly committed suicide in their home. Okay, by and, and this is not very ladylike. Um, she put a shotgun in her mouth and and pulled the trigger with you know with with her one of her hands you know that, that you know stuck it up here and then she she put her thumb or something on the trigger and blew her head off. You know it's like you know that's not very ladylike. It's, yeah, it's, women don't do that. No, exactly. You know, so I mean, women. You know, I mean, I, I'm I'm not. You know, not a hundred percent, but usually women, you know, want, want to preserve their 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 looks. You know, I mean, that's psychologically speaking, that's what generally happens. You know, but man, you put a shotgun in your mouth, man, your your head is not. I mean, you may as well be the ho horseless. I mean, the headless horseman. You know, from the, you know, Ichabod Crane. You know. <laughs> yeah. So um, so they don't start robbing until late 1985. Does does your uh, bank robbing squad immediately take take it over? Right, because uh, I mean, it, it's there's a division of labor, you know. I mean, any robbery in, in a city or a state it can be a, a, a state and local violation, okay, by by statute, okay. But uh, federal violations have to have a, a federal nexus, and bank robberies and bank extortions and armored truck robberies and stuff like that, you know, those have a, fe a federal nexus, you know, and that that's the FDIC fe federal insurance, you know, which is why we get involved, you know. I actually went to a bank robbery in Washington, D.C. Uh, before uh, before I got transferred to Miami. We showed up, we did the investigation, you know, with the, I mean, like, you know, like TV, you know, gangbusters and this and that. And, <laughs> One of the senior agents, you know, was talking to the managers. Okay, uh, we need your FDIC uh, insurance number. And uh, the manager said, uh, "We're not FDIC uh, insured." And he goes, "What?" He said, "No, we we're not FDIC insured." And and the the senior agent says, "Hey, boys, stop." He said, "We're out of here. This is not an FB, This is not a federal violation, you know. So it, it, uh, we left it to the Metro PD. I, I'd never. I mean, that's. I only saw that one time in my career, and it was like, wow. stop what you're doing, you know. And we walked out. It's like Ugh. someone had to explain it to me. I'm thinking, what what happened, you know? So in, anyway, so uh, as soon as Platt and Maddox got involved uh, in in their uh, escapades, it, it became a federal violation right away. And that that happened. The first robbery was in August. And uh, let me backtrack. Between April 
when I eighty five when I got there until August when when we when we had the first Platinum Maddox robbery, there was still a lot of work in between. I mean, don't get me wrong. I mean, we weren't sitting on the beach, you know, sipping uh, pina coladas, you know, and stuff under 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 the palm trees. We had um, it was a, a bank robbery almost at least once a day, sometimes two robberies a day, wow. uh, and uh, armored truck robberies at least two or three a week. On average, two a week, and then you had the fugitive cases assigned to you. And then you had, uh, you know, uh, every, our squad was re responsible for kidnapping cases, but thank God those didn't happen very often. I mean, maybe once a year, but, uh, so there were other, there were other, there was other work, you know, and at the time there were two other gangs go, uh, working in Miami and, um, for simplistic purposes or for the simplicity of explaining it, explaining it to you is, um, Mostly because we didn't know <laughs> that we could we call them the the Hispanic gang or that we call them the Cuban gang and then we call them the black gang because witnesses you know said hey they, listen they were they were Latins they were Hispanics okay and witnesses would say yes they were black males okay so very simply you know we had two other gangs going the black gang and the Cuban gang okay so we had a, an active dance card if you if, you know if, if if I may say. Uh, with armored truck robbers and bank robbers. And then you had your average run of the mill, you know, uh, amateur bank robber, you know, guys, guy with a note comes in or guy with a gun, lone gunman comes in, you know, that type of stuff. So, I mean, it was a busy, busy time, you know, but August, something changed, <laughs> you know, even, even by Miami standards, it was, it was kind of weird. Um, it was a steak and ale restaurant. Uh, back when Wells Fargo was still still had armored trucks, uh, they were red, you know, armored trucks, you know. So we we call them the the red boxes. Um, so an armored truck pulls up to the Steak and Ale restaurant on eighty on eighty eighth uh, Street and one hundred and seventh Avenue or something like that. And uh, courier jumps out of the back of the truck, goes into the restaurant, goes in and does his business, picks up whatever you know funds you know the the the, uh, the restaurant wants to, to uh, deposit courier is walking out of the front of the restaurant it's around lunchtime and uh two two individuals pop out of the uh bushes next to the front door and attack him from behind uh one of them hits him on the head and knocks him down and the other one grabs his uh, uh revolver from his holster and uh, they stuck a gun in his face, you know, and, and brought him up, you know. And then one of some one of the two guys uh, stuck a, a a revolver in his on his on his right side on, behind the ear, and grabs him in a chokehold, and says, you know, don't be stupid, don't die, you know, just do what we tell you. That type of stuff, it's standard, you know, movie script stuff, you know. So then they march him, you know, with an arm around his neck and a pistol in his ear, you know. Uh, march him to to where the driver of the of the uh, armored truck is, and uh, they tell him, you know, tell your partner to open the truck. You know, they 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 parade him, you know, <laughs> over to the driver's side, and you know, they say, hey, you know, hand signals, you know, hey, you know, and he's yelling at at at, at the dry uh, the courier is yelling at the driver, open the door, open the door, you know. And guess what the policy is for armored trucks? <clears throat> Don't open it. Don't open it, right? Nope. Exactly. You know, so, I mean, that's kind of cold-blooded, you know, <laughs> but it is it is what it is, you know. So what the driver did is he puts the truck in, in drive and he just tar starts to drive out of the parking lot. And the, uh, the the guard, the courier, is like, oh, my God, he's stupid. He shouldn't have done that. He should have opened the door. Please don't kill me. Don't kill me. You know, he's begging for his life, you know, so. I mean, I think any one of us in that position would probably probably do the same thing, you know. So, two things happened uh, at that point: uh, the the individual with the assault rifle fires off about fourteen or fifteen rounds at the back of the armored truck, and uh, the guy with the with the gun, you know, in, in the courier's ear, you know, bops him on the head again, and he knocks him down, you know. But uh, you know, armored trucks are called armored for a reason. Those those rounds in the back of the truck just li literally just bounced off you know just ricocheted you know sp splattered you know and um 
the uh, the two bandits ran to a car in the parking lot, jumped in the car, and then speed out of the parking lot. The shooting was unusual. I mean, that even even by Miami standards. I mean, don't get me wrong. I mean, shootings happen a lot. Okay, but people know. I mean, why are you shooting at an armored truck? I mean, it's like it's you know half or one inch steel doors and walls and stuff like that. You know, it, even a 50 cal may not be able to penetrate, you know, maybe it would, I don't know. Uh, but then when they're speeding out of the parking lot, what the passenger takes out two smoke grenades, he pulls the pins on, on two smoke grenades and then sticks them out the, the passenger side window and tosses them on the street behind them and as they speed away, so these smoke grenades land, they pop and they start putting up smoke all over the place. And I'm thinking, you know, we got there and we, and we heard the description and we wonder what the hell is going on? Why would anybody driving a car throw a smoke grenade? You know, it's like, I mean, you're military, you, you know yeah. what a smoke grenade can do. I mean, it, it, it depends on, on, the, on the type and the wind and so on and so forth. I mean, you can go around smoke, you know, I mean, <laughs> on, a, on a street, you know, but even, even by Miami standards, okay, firing, you know, a, an assault rifle at the back of a semi, at, at a, a armored truck and then popping, you know, dropping two smoke grenades to cover your escape is unusual. Okay, so that that was the tip that we got. It's like, what the hell? These guys aren't from around here, are they? You know, so you know, I mean, it was it's kind of funny, but it was it was very serious, you know. So um, that that happened, and we you know we I mean, based on the mo of, between the Cubans and the black gangs, you know, it, w it wasn't the same. Okay, then the following week, one week later. Well, and you uh, knew they were white guys, right? Because you no, had a, no, no, no. We, 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 no, the witnesses didn't know who they were. You know, were they so wearing masks? They were wearing total, total okay. coverage. Okay. Ski masks, gloves. Okay. You know, the only thing that that they had was their eyeballs. You know, but you know, you know as well as I do, when when people are around uh, gunfire, the, their their thought process gets kind of fuzzy. Okay, mm -hmm. and their eyesight gets fuzzy. You know, everything <laughs> everything gets fuzzy. You know, so but that uh, one week later. Uh, at about uh, about 80, 70 blocks away uh, on the same general area. I mean, I say 70 blocks away, but I mean, Miami's a huge, you know, spread out town, you know, and stuff. Um, there was a bank robbery call at a Winn-Dixie restaurant. I mean, a Winn-Dixie uh, grocery store. Um so by the time we get down there, our, our, our office is in you know, north central Miami. By the time we get, it's like 30, 40 miles from the office down there. So, I mean, even with lights and sirens, it would take you a while. But, and lights and sirens and traffic, you know, it's like, it would take you half an hour to get down there. So by the time we got down there, everything was had settled down. Again, it was 12 noon in a parking lot in front of a grocery store. Armored truck courier uh, this this armored truck uh, company had uh, because there were so many robbers down there that the and so many uh, guards getting getting hurt that um, they uh, started going through to uh, you had the the driver and the courier and like the old uh, you know Wells Fargo you know wagon you know stagecoach uh, you know drivers they went to a driver and a shotgun and the courier Okay, and this guy really was a shotgun. Okay, he was he was uh, riding uh, in front in the in the front of the cab with a shotgun. So when they pulled up to a store or a business, the shotgun would get out. He would reconnoiter the area, and then he would uh, place his back up against the you know next to the entrance uh, of the store with a shotgun up like this, looking around, make sure, and then he would signal and tell the courier he could come out. So the courier would come out, you know, dash inside the, the business, do his uh, deed, and then step out, wait for the for the shotgun to give him the okay, hey, it's clear, come on out. And then he would go into the truck, and then the, the shotgun would go into the shotgun position, you know, the passenger side. So, I mean, that that's how bad it was for armored truck drivers. I mean, they, they actually re resurrected the old shotgun position, you know, wow. <laughs> the armored trucks. Anyway. This truck had a shotgun, and uh, there were three couriers, three three guards. 
the they, they went through the procedure that I just described for you. The, the guy backs up against the wall. The courier goes in. <clears throat> when the courier comes out, like he takes like four or five steps out of the entrance of the uh, uh, the grocery store, and um, something weird happened. Somebody yelled "freeze!" and as soon as they yelled "freeze," a gunshot uh, comes out, and it ended up being a shotgun blast. Uh, 12, 12, uh, 12 gauge uh, shotgun, double out buck, hits the courier in the legs. So he, he's walking like this, and then the, the rounds hit him. It sweeps his legs out from under him, and he falls down, you know. So um, so he goes down in the street, and then the shotgun and the driver are, are wondering, what the hell happened? You know, and they turn around, and they see uh, somebody dressed in dark clothing. Uh, moving around behind the truck and then they open up. I mean, the driver oh. opened, uh, fired six shots, the the shotgun fired five shots, oh. and then even the courier that was down fired six shots from his revolver. The total, I think it was like 17 shots fired by the guards. And then the robbers fired, they estimated at least 12 to 15 shots in return, okay? In the middle of a parking lot in front of a grocery store at high noon, okay? And miraculously, only the guard was shot in the initial uh, opening volley. You know, boom, he goes down. Nobody else was hit. Amazing. Wow. Okay, in this parking lot. Okay, and when we responded down there, we heard what had happened. It's like, what? And, you know, immediately we, we suspected, I mean, we couldn't prove it, you know, but we suspected it was the same yahoos from the steak and ale that had been tr tried to uh, to rob uh, the armored truck uh, at the um, at the Wind Dixie, and I interviewed a whole bunch of people. Oh, by the way, going back to the steak and ale, I interviewed the guard, the guard with the, with the gun in his ear, so I, I know exactly what <laughs> happened. You know, I, I had a very long and personal conversation with him, so I can kind of smirk, you know, about it because it's you know kind of funny now. You know, it's like, oh man, I beg for my life, please don't kill me, please don't. Kill me. Any one of us would do it, you know. In fire, oh, yeah. you know? <laughs> anyway, so we, we responded to Win Dixie, and uh, it's just pandemonium. I mean, there was like thirty witnesses, and uh, again, the only thing that was consistent was dark clothing, you know. And that was it, okay? Because some people said there was two two robbers. Some people said there was three robbers, okay? Some people said it was a uh, a green car. Some people said it was a, a yellow car. Some people said it was a gold car. Some people said it was a, a two-door car. Some people said it was a four-door car. One person said it was a pickup truck. Another person said it was a station wagon. Okay. And then one person said that the, the car had a sunroof and that the shooter with, with, the, with the long weapon was standing out of the sunroof while, while his partner's driving the car through the parking lot, shooting from the sunroof. It's like, what? It was like a circus, you know. <laughs> you know, and I think you know. Honestly, we we put the the sunroof guy, the sunroof witness, and the pickup truck and the station wagon witness. We kind of put them on the side, you know, because everybody else kept saying, "Hey, it was a two or four door car." That I, that you can understand, you know. Yeah, you're, you're shocked, and the, somebody fires thirty shots in a parking lot. You're going to go, "Holy cow," you know. Um, so and, you know, so you know, you can be forgiven for saying, "Well, I don't know whether it was two door or four door," you know. So, but we were getting closer on the color. You know, it was like um, gold or yellow or green. You know, that type of car. You know, but the mo was the same: dark clothing. That's all we knew, and we probably we suspected there was probably only two, whereas other people said that there, there may have been three. Okay, so. It's like you know, we said, "Hey, man, we got a new, we got some new, new, uh, new players in town." You know, so uh, two, two, uh, two at bats, two strikeouts. You know, they got that. They from the steak and ale, they only got the little money bag. You know, the little green bag. You know, I think they got like two thousand dollars in that. They got zero from the um, from the uh, Win Dixie. Now, approximately a week or um, eight days later. There was a, an armored truck uh, a call, a robbery call that came to the office. Again, it was in the southwest part of Miami. This was closer to the uh, the steak and ale restaurant uh, on the same major street. And uh, by the time we got there, 
uh, Metro had already been there and, and, and did their thing and, and interviewed people. So we showed up, you know, again, we we're like, you know, 40 miles away, you know, so, yeah. so, uh, I found out that, um, uh, th this armored truck, uh, company was going to the Daltz, D-A-L-T-S, Daltz, uh, restaurant. And, uh, the uh, conversation between the courier and the driver was, Hey, the, I can't find a place to park. I'm going to drop you off in front of the, the, the door. You jump out and I'm going to go down to the end of the building, make a turn and be waiting for you in a, in a pointing out, you know, in other words, ready to, to, to bear moose, you know, but I'll be at the corner of the building. So, you know, I can't be, I can't be parked in front of the restaurant, you know, like they normally do because there was just a tight parking lot, you know? So the courier goes in, does his business and he's coming out and he walks towards the truck. He looks, you know, to his right and he walks to, to the right uh, to, to where he saw the truck. When he's walking towards the truck, the truck is parked next to a, a dumpster. And uh, when he's walking towards the truck, he, he looks behind the dumpster or around the dumpster and he sees what he said was two individuals wearing dark clothing, okay, lurking behind the, the, the dumpster. And he said, this is what caught my ear. He said, it looked like the same guys that, that robbed us the first time. Okay, so he drew his revolver, and uh, you know, it warms your heart right? to, to some extent. He, he he made a preemptive strike. Yeah. You know, these guys are just kind of hanging around the dumpster. He draws his revolver and he fires four shots in the direction of of the the these two guys that he saw were hanging behind the dumpster. Okay, after he fired the four shots, you know, he, he said they, they ran, they disappeared. You know, he didn't see them. So he goes up to the driver's side door and he's pounding on the window, you know, and telling the, the driver, set the alarm, set the alarm, because these trucks have alarms, you know, that, that go right back to their headquarters. Mm -hmm. And from there, headquarters notifies the FBI and the police, hey, there's a, uh, there's a problem with one of our trucks and we think it's in the, this general area, you know. So, I mean, technology at the time, you know, if they got you within a grid, you know, you were doing pretty good. Yeah. You know? <laughs> kind of like a, you know, calling in artillery, you know. <laughs> yeah. But you know, they they uh, they, we, they got it, they got pretty close. So anyway, we responded, you know, and I I interviewed the the driver, you know, the courier, and I said, "What do you mean? It looked like the same guys that uh, attacked you last time. What, what do you mean by that?" And then I looked at him. I said, "Do I know you?" And I'm, I'm I'm looking at him a little closer, you know. And he goes, "I know who you are." That was the courier from the steak and ale. Wow. The guy who had the gun in his ear. You know, he said, please don't get me. He said, hey, you know what? It looked like the same guys. He said, it wasn't going to happen to me a second time. I saw him and I started shooting at him. You know? So, you know, no harm, no foul. You know, no, uh, nobody was wounded. Nobody, nobody was robbed, really. You know, so, uh, but he did report, you know, that the, um, that these guys were, uh, were, were out there. So that was three weeks in a row or, you know, or every seven or eight days, you know, three times in a row. And the, uh, they were very amateurish. Uh, but the first two robberies, though, they were pretty violent. I mean, shots fired, you know, and, you know, just all over the place. So um, we knew we had we had some different players. I mean, based on that MO. Well, initially, we thought they were um, <sighs> retired military guys or or uh, maybe active duty military guys from Homestead Air Force Base. Because uh, Homestead is just uh, about, from South Miami, it's about 20 miles from the Homestead Air Force Base. So it, it'd be a simple, quick drive from uh, Homestead to, to South Miami. So we we're, we were kind of exploring that that possibility. And, and you know, at the same time, this, this is, this is uh, probably before some people's time but back then, in the 80s, there was no such thing as survivalists, you know, I mean, because right, survivalists right. wasn't a thing back then. I mean, you had them, don't get me wrong, there were people out there, but they weren't, you know, they didn't have the, the, the catchphrase survivalist, you know, or militia, they didn't have those, you know, those names, you know, so, you know. So we just thought they were just what they used to be called retired military guys, <laughs> you know, or active duty military guys, you know. So, so uh, but as it turns out, you know, they they were uh, they weren't active duty, but they they had they were former military, you know. So, yeah. Let's see. Uh, 
was Maddox was a former Marine that joined the army. And I think Platt had been in the army and they met in the army. Is that correct? That is correct. Yeah. 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 You got that right. So, um, this keeps going on. Like you said, at every seven or eight days, uh, they're, 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 they're making a hit. It's amateurish at first, but then it gets increasingly violent. I think they kill some people at a quarry or something like that to steal well, see, vehicles. That's, and stuff that's, like that. that's the thing. See, uh, we didn't know when this first happened in August, we didn't know that the car that they were using had, we kind of suspected it, but um, we didn't really know the extent uh, of, of the efforts they went to, to, to steal that car. It wasn't until January of 1986 that the getaway car was recovered. And it was recovered because a, a, a customer who was around a, a ba the bank at the time that it was being robbed uh, followed the uh, the car out of the parking lot out of the bank parking lot and followed it to like a burger king that was a few blocks away and he watched them switching cars uh he, they went from uh, the stolen car to a white pickup truck and you know they didn't take their gear off in, in the parking lot they just jumped in you know and sped away in the pickup truck so he tried to follow them in the pickup truck, but then he lost him, you know, lost him in the traffic and stuff, you know? So, I mean, he was going one way and they were going the other way, you know, just by the time he turned around, he just couldn't, you know, couldn't, couldn't get there. But that's how we recovered the, um, the initial car. And the people said it was a, um, a, a gold car, a yellow car, a green car. And it ended up being a gold col colored Monte Carlo that had, uh, was owned by, uh, uh, Emilio Briel. Um, he had the misfortune of going to target practice in the in the Everglades. Um, that used to be a common thing, you know. Um, you know, Miami has a lot of ranges, gun ranges, but some people just, you know, didn't have the cash, you know, so they would go out in the Everglades and just plink plink away, you know, in in, in, a, in, a, in different spots. And uh, according to his parents. Uh, and I interviewed the parents because when when we ran the tag, you know, it, it came came back up to Emilio Brill, missing person, stolen car, that type of thing, you know. So I interviewed the the, the family, and um, it ended up being that Emilio Brill went to target practice one day and then just disappeared, and he was never seen from. Again, that was in August, okay, and the car was recovered in January, and unfortunately. Um, you know, the family was hoping that we had news of their son. And in a way, we kind of did. You know, we we, we re had recovered his car, but not him, you know. So uh, that was in January. Nothing happened between January and March. Okay, they kind of took a hiatus or something, you know, a vacation. I mean, uh, who knows? But um, on March 1st, uh, two, so a couple of hikers were, were hiking in the Everglades and and they saw something and in, in underneath some bushes looked like a pair of sneakers or something and, and they kind of looked at it they went over and investigate and then they saw uh, what looked like a pair of, of pants or jeans you know attached to the sneakers and then they looked and there was the skeletal remains inside the clothing you know and they go oh crap you know so they walked away and they they called the police and then they brought the police over to the scene and then showed them what they had found and through dental records i think they, it was because dna wasn't a thing back then um and the missing persons uh, report and so on and so forth you know they they uh, were able to identify that the remains were emilio Briel. You know, he had been uh, shot and killed in the Everglades, uh, had a bullet, had a hole in his skull right here. You know, I mean, you got your your eye, your eye sockets and then you have it. Most of us don't have an extra hole here. You know? So they just shot him point black in the face, you know, boom, he was gone, you know, so. And they stole his car. And that was the car that was being used uh, for, um, for all those robberies. Now, the interesting thing, I mean, I mean, the whole thing is interesting, but the, it's, more interesting is that that was March 1st, okay. March 12th of the same month, like 11 days later, Jose Calazo, 
had the misfortune of going to the Everglades to target practice. Okay, and he he had no idea that you know somebody had been shot and killed in in the very area that he was attending. You know, he was he was just went out to to his favorite spot. So uh, he is driving a black Monte Carlo. <clears throat> he drives into um, into this area, and it's hard to get back there. It's like you know, just a dirt road. I mean, there's no paved roads. It's just a like an old dirt road, you know. Except that it's got a, a lot of bumps and ruts and stuff like that. You almost need like an SUV to get back there. But he drove his Monte Carlo back there, and um, he survived the encounter. Um, he said that he drove in there, parked, was just shooting his twenty-two, you know, having a good old time, you know. And he said sometime I don't know, ten, fifteen minutes later. He heard a car coming up the uh, the uh, dirt road, and he looked over and he sees a white pickup truck. And the white pickup truck's kind of like driving around, and they park in not not close to him, but you know, obviously, you know, relatively close, maybe like forty yards away. And uh, two white guys get out of the car, you know, and got out of, get out of the pickup truck, and he stops shooting, and he looks at him, he acknowledges them. And they acknowledge him, you know, it's like, hey, I'm shooting in this direction, you know, don't shoot in my in my direction, you know, you know, that's, that's range safety, you know, in the Everglades, you know, so, you know, they, they kind of figured out, you know, through hand signals, you know, and stuff like that, hey, we're, we're going to shoot in that direction, you know, so everything was cool, you know, so he just continues uh, doing his thing, shooting, plinking away. And he said, after a few minutes, maybe 10, 15 minutes, you know, he said he kind of sensed something behind him. And uh, he said he turned around, and there's the two white guys. One's got an assault rifle, and one's got a revolver in his hand, and they're both aiming at him. Okay, and uh, he said, oh, crap, this is this is not a good thing. So uh, they walked right up on him and said, hey, listen, uh, pal, you know, uh, we, want your, we want your car, we want your wallet, we want your guns. And if, you're, if you've got two, uh, two individuals, you know, triangulizing triangulizing you like this you know it's like what, what are you going to say i mean you're you comply you know it's like they, they got the drop on you once once got an assault rifle once got the revolver you know so um he complied he said hey man okay no problems man take it take it just leave me alone you know it's like and uh they took the stuff you know and then the guy with the revolver who ended up according to him being maddox gets closer to him and he tells him turn around and the guy turns around you know and and, and maddox sticks the gun in his in the back like like this you know like uh, we call it encouraging nudges like uh -huh. you know move and the guy goes what move what he said walk over towards that lake and he's <laughs> the light bulb bulb goes off it's like Ugh. why why do you want me to walk her? Shut up and just and, and again the encouraging nudges, you know, with the muzzle of the, <laughs> of the revolver in the center of your back. It's like, okay, okay, man. You know, so Calazo says he he's not in a hurry. He's not he's not like you know walking in a, at a brisk pace. He's kind of like dragging his feet, you know, trying to figure out what the hell. He says, hey, he knows that they're going to shoot him. You know, he says hey, just simple. I mean, uh, it didn't take a, a PhD to figure that one out. So. He did something that he probably saw in some movie someplace, uh, and law enforcement officers are taught, you know, you've got your hands up, and someone's got a, they're so close that they've got, they've got a gun, I mean, literally on your person like this. He, he had his hands up like this, so he swept, you know, did the old, you know, Bruce Lee karate move, you know. He sweeps to his right, and his right arm catches the the gun hand of the guy behind him it totally surprised him you know he said he, he he was surprised it worked because he just spun around real quick you know and he he got he got the the gun you know off his center and he moved the gun off to the side and then he starts grabbing the gun and and then he and plant and maddox start fighting for the gun you know and they're standing up you know fighting like this tug of war and, and they're cursing and trying to punch each other and stuff like that so I really couldn't tell you how long that that lasted, but he's Galazzo said it seemed like an eternity, an eternity, you know. So, and during the struggle for the gun, you know, the gun is between them. The gun goes off, you know, you know, a couple of times right between them, 
you know, goes goes off a couple of times, and then at some point in time, you know, Platt, uh, Maddox jerks the, the revolver away, and uh, Calazzo shot through the the, the left palm uh, of his hand like this, and of course he he loses all control of of, of his hand, and at some point in the sequence of events, uh, he Calazzo gets shot through the right shoulder, takes around through the right shoulder. And of course, that, that that stuns you. I mean, you have a lot of nerves up here in this area, and it's called the uh, brachial plexus, I believe it's called. And uh, at that point, he's kind of like staggering back. And the third time he was shot, uh, let me... the third time he was shot, he was shot in the face. And uh, Time, time and chance, <clears throat> luck. Uh, imagine getting shot in the face at, at this angle. Okay, that that angle is uh, the round is going to, to my center mass. Okay, it would go penetrate my face and and probably end up in my brain brainstem. But uh, as luck would have it, uh, Calazo, Jose Calazo was. was Having a pretty good day. I mean, all things considered, <laughs> he's shot in the face, like right here. But instead of the angle like this, the angle was like this. Okay, so it's angled to the right. So the bullet passes through his nasal passages and continues in a, through the side of his head, and the round exits right behind his right ear in this area here. So all things being equal, he's having a pretty good day. You know, I mean, consider, <laughs> consider and that was a, a 357 Ed. That's what uh, shot it. It was a, a, at least a 38 caliber. We, we don't, we don't know whether it was 357 round. I think a 357 round probably would just would have exploded your head, you know, with yeah. all the, the muzzle blast alone probably would have blinded you, you know, so permanently, you know, so, but, um, uh, that round, he said, it just, I mean, kicked him back, knocked, I mean, knocked him unconscious for um, at, at least a few seconds, okay, if not for 30 seconds or a minute, you know. So I've been asked several questions about what happened next because these guys were pretty vicious, cold-blooded bastard killers, you know. And I, I, I've been asked this question, and, and I, I'm, my answer is only speculation. You know, why didn't Maddox shoot him some more? When he, when he went down and he fell on his back, and, and he was right by the edge of the lake. Okay, he fell on, uh, he fell on his stomach, I'm sorry. And uh, why didn't Maddox walk over and shoot him a couple of more times in, in the back? And you know what? I would speculate that he probably tried that. But here's a trick question for your audience. How many shots does a six-shot revolver have? <laughs> Let six. me think. That's a poser. <laughs> no, obviously, he had a six-shot revolver. Okay, and they're fighting over the weapon. Bang, bang. Okay, and then bang through the hand, bang through the shoulder, and then bang, you know, in the face. So somewhere along along the, the, the struggle, I'm pretty sure Maddox expended all six rounds in the in the revolver. Okay. And the reason he didn't shoot Galazzo in the back a couple of times is because he was out of ammo. Okay. And at, at that point in time, I mean, you know, 99 times out of a hundred, if you get shot in the face at close range, it's more than likely a killing shot. Okay. Um, I mean all things being equal, maybe 95% of the time. Okay. But this is, this is that 5% of the time where it wasn't. Okay. Um, so he probably thought, Hey, I shot this guy in the face. He's dead. You know, I don't need, you know, I don't, I don't I'm not going to take the time to you know, drop, drop the casings, reload six more and then shoot this guy in the back. <laughs> you know, so they probably figured, Hey, you know what? We better, we better get going while the going is good. You know, so after, after this big commotion fight, you know, they, they probably picked up their gear, picked up Calazzo's uh, gear and car and drove away. OK, so they drove away in, in, the, in their white pickup truck and, and the, his black Monte Carlo. OK, now, the interesting part, I mean, besides this whole scenario that I just described for you, um, 
the struggle, the fight, you know, back and forth, you know, and stuff like that. I mean, you know, the the fantastically interesting part is that Jose Calazo is not or was not a trained professional. Okay. He wasn't military trained. He wasn't a law enforcement officer. You know, he probably saw this sweeping move, you know, the karate Bruce Lee, you know, you know, the, you know <laughs> take the take the muzzle off your, your center mass and then try to struggle for the gun. Okay, he probably saw that in a movie. Okay. So he wasn't a trained professional. Okay, but he fought, he he had the will to survive. Okay, he fought, you know, it, it could have been he could have been to his end. He, but he fought and fought and fought, you know, and, and it, luckily for him, it wasn't his end. Okay, so th that's the first thing I tell people. I said, hey, he wasn't a trained professional. Okay, he was just a regular citizen who had a strong will to survive. Okay, now the, <laughs> the will to survive continues because after he recovers from the, from the, the blast of the face, he, he kind of comes to. And he realizes he's still around, he's alive and everything's quiet around him. You know, it's like, okay, I'm here and they're not. So he figured, hey, they just took off, you know, grabbed his stuff. He had to make a decision. Okay, what am I going to do? I'm in the Everglades. I mean, this this little spot for shooting is not, not a high traffic area, <laughs> you know. So, I mean... If you get one shooter, two shooters a day, you're you know it's it's it's, it's a rush hour. Uh, so he had to make a decision. You know, do do I do I lay here and die, or do I try to do something and maybe still die, but maybe survive? You know, so he chose to be proactive. He chose to to try to survive. So he said he. He kind of like struggled to his feet, you know, got got on his hands and knees, you know, was crawling at first, you know, just kind of feeling his injury. His, his head was throbbing. And um, he uh, said he kind of like tried to get up and he was staggering. He was uh, about a mile on that dirt road to, to the nearest highway. And that was uh, Southwest 8th Street, which turns into the Tamiami Trail in from miami to naples okay the old old highway okay so from the the spot where he was shooting to the highway was of almost a whole mile it was like nine tenths of a mile okay and there's there's nothing there it's just alligators you know mosquitoes and uh palmetto bugs you know and a whole bunch of little shrubs and stuff you know uh so he had a very strong will to survive right? and uh he managed he he said he fought struggled staggered crawled to get to the highway and that was only half his battle or a third of his battle i mean he, he's been battling this whole time you know he gets to the highway and what would a, 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 a miami native do if you saw somebody staggering out of the everglades covered in mud and blood you know waving his arms like the swamp my swamp thing you know <laughs> like this what, what would a miami native do well what, what miami natives do you know they just spit on by it's like hey i'm not getting involved you know so he's trying to flag people down on the highway you know and nobody's stopping Choo, cars are just flashing by you know and it wasn't until you know god love them uh a bunch of tourists uh, a couple, uh, not a bunch a couple of tourists from up north, I think it was from Minnesota or Wisconsin. Uh, they were they were driving to Miami on their honeymoon, and um, they they're driving towards you know from from they're driving from west to east towards Miami, and they see this guy on the side of the road, you know, all covered in mud, and it looks like he's bleeding and stuff. So, the, you know, being good Samaritans, you know, not not jaded, twisted, you know, people from Miami, you know, they actually stopped. And they, they pull over to the side and ask this, are you okay, buddy? Are you, are, what, what? And he, he's begging them, please help me, please help me. You know, I'm hurt. I, I've been shot. You know, can you help me? So they said, well, we, we can go for the cops or something like that. Said, no, 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 don't leave me. You know, so uh, they put him in, in their in their car or, or van, whatever it was. And uh, he tells them that there's a uh, like a Circle K 
in the direction that they had just come from, like about, about a mile down the road. So they make a U-turn and drive down to the Circle K, and that's where the, where the first semblance of, of, of civilization is, right there at that intersection of Chrome and Tamiami Trail. Um, and uh, the store owner uh, called called 911, called the cops, you know, and they, the ambulance came out and they, they uh, attended him and, and took him to uh, Miami Hospital, Miami-Dade, and he survived. And he was our first live witness. Uh, he was able to give us a description of the two white males, absolutely white males, as opposed to just, you know, eyeballs sticking out of a, you know, uh, ski mask. And uh, he gave us a description. They were uh, had light brown, dark brown hair, you know, mustache. One had a real thick mustache. The other one had a thinner mustache. Uh, they were fit. Uh, they were about six feet, six foot one. 200 pounds each. Uh, he said uh, they were very disciplined. That was the word that came out. They were very disciplined. And he said they knew what they were doing. So that kind of you know, alludes to the fact that they were military trained, you know, and, um, and stuff. So, uh, so Metro got a sketch artist and they kind of worked with them to try to, to try to come up with a composite, you know, of, of uh, who these guys were and, and stuff or what they looked like. So um, he was a tremendous resource, a tremendous witness. We got a description of the white pickup truck all the way down to, he had, he said they had a little pin, pin striped line on the side of the, of the pickup truck. It was like a red, red pin stripe. And he said it was an F, uh, uh, a Ford F-150, white, and got a good description of the, the two players. He said, hey, he recognized the rifle. He said it was a, uh, a Mini-14 and uh, a revolver. Uh, he couldn't t- tell you if it was a Smith & Wesson or some other model. <clears throat> and, of course, we got the description of his car. Uh, it's a black Monte Carlo, Florida tag, NTJ891. Man, I'll never forget that tag. I mean, that, that tag is, you know, branded into my brain, you know. So um, we knew nothing. We knew nothing about Colasso. That, that incident happened on March 12th. And as luck would have it, March 13th, we're in the squad area. And Ben Grogan is, is sitting there. He was a case agent on, on, on these robberies. And it was like 8.30 in the morning. You know, everybody was busy, you know, getting ready for the for hearings or surveillances or whatever, you know, serving subpoenas or whatever. And uh, we're all sitting there. And then all of a sudden, you know, Ben's reading the paper and, and he takes his hand like this and he slams it on the desk. He goes, boom. He goes, this is our next bank robbery car. And he said it in a loud voice, you know, and the big slam on the desk, you know, made it made a big bang noise. And everybody looked around and says, Ben, what are you talking about? What's going on? He said, look, I'm reading this in the paper. It's in the paper. Some guy was robbed and left for dead out in the Everglades in the same place where that other kid was was robbed and killed. And we said, what? He said, yeah, I guarantee you that this is going to be our next robbery car. I, 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 I bet money on it, you know? And uh, being the, you know, being, being that we had a lot of respect for Ben Grogan, he was a senior agent, you know, he was 53, he'd been in the bureau almost like 20, 22 years, 21 years. Being professionals that we were, we all looked at Ben and goes, oh, Ben, you're full of shit. You know, so we started <laughs> laughing, laughing at him. I said, what are you? So he said, no, man. I, he said, I'm telling you, this is going to be the car. So he said, he, he may start making some phone calls, you know, because he, he'd been in Miami like forever. He knew all the, the Metro robbery guys by first name, you know, and had their phone number. So he calls around and he finds out where, where Calazzo, uh, what hospital he was in. So he arranges to go out uh to interview Colazzo is him uh, and Steve Warner went out to interview him and uh, they got all the information, you know, even though he had already told Metro about it, he, the, the bureau got all the information, you know, and, and it, it's a, a, a tale of survival that's, you know, fit for any book, you know, and that was on the 12th on the 13th. I'm sorry. Um, a week later, there's a bank robbery. 
with the black Monte Carlo. In in South Miami. <laughs> As luck would have it, you know, Ben had the last laugh, okay? And the reason we know that it was the car is because there was a U.S. Customs uh, in, uh, inspector, n not a customs agent, you know, but a, one of the inspectors he liked at, at the airports and stuff like that, you know, mm -hmm. they checked the bags and stuff like that. He was uh, driving. He was driving to the Barnett Bank at uh, 136th Street and South Dixie Highway uh, to cash a check. And I, I keep I keep ha having to remind people, you know, that. That's that's old school, you know. I said, hey, there were no debit cards back then. There was no money transfers on your cell phone. You, if you wanted money, you actually had to take a paper check and, right. and go into a bank and and get money. You know, I mean, there's no there's no cards at the end of the machine, ATM machines and stuff like that. So anyway, so he's he's driving to the bank and he's parking in front of the or, or close to the front of the bank entrance. When he's parking his car, he looks at the front entrance and he, he said, I saw two individuals, two men wearing camouflage you know, uh, clothing uh, and uh, ski masks. One of them had an assault rifle and the other one had a revolver in his hand come running out of the bank entrance. OK. And he said, mm, you know what, maybe I should wait to cash my check. You know, so probably a good move on his part, you know. Yeah. So anyway, he, he hunkers down and he's watching this and he, being a law enforcement officer, he's he's he has a different uh, observation technique than most civilians do. He he took notice of their 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 dress and uh, he saw them jump into a black car. And when that black car backed out of the parking space, the tag was right, right in his face. And he he wrote the tag down. It was NTJ eight nine one. It was Jose Calazo's car. So Ben had the last laugh, you know, because I mean the customs officer verified the tag, you know that that uh, that from Calazo's car, you know. So it was uh, it was kind of a closes the circle on that, you know, kind of a humorous side story on that, even though there was a bank robbery, you know. So. Yeah. And now I, as your interviewer, sir, I know that it's 435 where you are right now. Um, okay. Okay. Uh, we, we can, we can come back and pick up at some other time. I know? think this is a, know, a, 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 perfectly a good, good time to stop. Yeah. It is probably a good time to stop. And then uh, you and I will get together after the show and uh, find out a time that I can get you back on hopefully Absolutely. very soon. Absolutely. And, uh, yeah. and we'll pick up right where the customs inspector Gets down the tag number, bang! Now you guys know what you're working with, right? Or exactly. more or less, yeah. Exactly right. You know, so and I apologize to the audience. You know, it's just a, our schedules are kind of hectic right now. You know, so but I'll be back. You know, well as soon as as soon as you give me uh, uh, an alter uh, another date, you know, I'll be glad to come back and and, and talk to you folks. And, and the intro, of, you know, I don't know what your program is. If people have questions, I can email you or something like that. And and because uh, sometimes people do have questions. You know, I, I may not have covered something properly or omitted something you know uh so but you know i'll be glad to answer any questions that come up yeah i'm looking at the comments or uh terry says wow you should write a book this is interesting yeah <laughs> and mr yeah ed did write a book it's in the links in the show notes please pick it up I have, a copy of, I have a copy of it right here <laughs> yeah, there we go oh. fbi miami firefight five minutes that changed the bureau and i would say <laughs> you know and, and you know, real quick, when I was uh, at high risk personnel course 30 years ago, we spent an entire day studying this gunfight before we went out and learned to fight around vehicles. And then when yeah. I was in the police academy, we studied this and studied it and studied it because it changed everything. And we're going to get to that in uh, part two. And just, uh, Ed, a lot of people are saying great show, fascinating stuff. And, um, can't wait for part two. Uh, Walt says, can't wait for the next one. Ed will be messaging you soon with other questions. <laughs> How can I order the book? Can I get a signed copy? Um, of course. All you have to do is pay money. You know, money. <laughs> money. No, uh, they can order from my website or from Amazon. Uh, either way, it it, it, it it all comes to me, you know, and, and I autograph all books, you know, free of charge, you know, so... Uh, I mean, with, with whatever whatever they, they want, you know, they can order from Amazon or from my website, you know, so uh, it, it gets to me either way. Yeah. And Alan, who's a ret retired Virginia State Trooper, says, let's get the next so scheduled great show and we will. <laughs>
So Ed, okay. thanks for coming on. Thank you for part okay. one. I'm going to uh, call you later, sir, and we'll schedule on okay. part two. Okay. Thanks, guys. And I really appreciate the the interest and I appreciate your, your asking me. Uh, and again, you know, uh, kudos to your sponsors. You know, I mean, it can't happen without them, you know, so uh, and, and it's just my pleasure to be here and, and, and share the story, you know. So anyway, we'll see you guys next time. Can't wait. Thank Ed. Thanks, guys. Thank Bye. Bye-bye.